Hi there. You're in the lab with your mate JJ. So uh, today's uh, uh, part three of, of the main show. Uh, we're doing the new book teardown. Uh, if you've been paying attention, we uh, we made our uh, aerial recently, our, our aerial cable uh, with the alligator clips, and then we did an old book teardown about frequency modulation, um, particularly as it pertains to radio, obviously. Um, and today we're going to uh, uh, do the new book teardown. And um, oh yeah, and, and today's silly job title is uh, Master Planner. I'm the Master Planner. So yeah, the, the the book that we'll be looking at today is this monster. And honestly, I don't know how long it's going to take to get through this thing because it's just monstrous. Uh, it's another hundred one thousand two hundred page, you know, uh, just tome. Um, so I suppose there's no point uh, uh, telling you anything more about it. We might as well just pop it over to the bench and have a look at it. So let's go. Here we are on the bench. Now I suppose we might as well start on the back. Can you see that? Oh, dear me. All right. So this is... Uh, Okay. Oh, look, we've got uh, uh, Lady Ada again. So she had nice things to say about the uh, the Art of Electronics third edition. So uh, looks like we've got uh, four words of praise from various people. So let's uh, let's see what they had to say. Learning the Art of Electronics, a hands-on course, provides a perfect introduction to electronics for aspiring experimentalists. The style is both playful and practical, not only hands-on, but minds-on as well. We've been happily using previous editions of the student manual in Wesley College physics courses for the last 30 years. This latest installment is easily the best yet. Robbie Berg, Glenn Stark, James Batat, Wesley Co College Physics. Then, uh, if you are going to learn the art of electronics, You'll need to spend some time practicing that art with your own two hands. Thinking about it isn't enough, and that's what makes this course book so useful to those of us study, studying to understand electronics. The 25 lessons are designed to teach by example, so you can learn via the many hands-on labs. Going through these exercises will open your eyes to how electronic components act in real life, how your tools can help or deceive, and how to debug and analyze the day-to-day -day challenges of engineering. And that was from uh, Lee Moore, Lady Ada Fried uh, of Ada Fruit Industries. And then the third remark, this was my favorite book and class in graduate school. I'd taken electronics labs before, but never really got it. The book is very clearly written and thought out. I had a wonderful sense of continual aha moments uh, going through it. It's also just fun to read. You feel like a friend is explaining it all to you. This new edition adds some valuable sections. One on the black art of fighting parasitic oscillations. It has some great new projects as well, including one that I did when it was being introduced, where the class designs a device for transmitting music across the room with an infrared LED. When we got that one to work, I felt like I could do anything. Honestly, the whole class is really empowering in that basic way. As complicated as my iPhone is, I feel like basically inside it's got a clock and some memory and a CPU and some buses. I imagine I n know roughly how it works. I feel like I know this secret and no one else does. To them it, it's magic, but I know. <laughs> David Kessenbaum of National Public Radio. And then the last remark, having learned electronics 25 years ago from the student guide, I've greatly enjoyed working <coughs> Tom's new and updated labs into our electronics course at Penn. Uh, the intuitive hands-on style of these labs exercises make them fun and highly effective. 
The labs guide students through building and studying each circuit, but are peppered with questions and design choices that force one to think carefully and to check one's understanding at each step. Our students especially love building the classic AM radio receiver and the new PID motor controller. These exercises reinforce key concepts, filters, rectifiers, op-amps, feedback, and provide a great sense of accomplishment once they work. These labs are a treasure. And that's Bill Ashmanska of the University of Pennsylvania. There we go. So some glowing praise of our book. Okay. All right. Well, this we might as well read. Uh, it says, Learning the Art of Electronics. I wonder if they're talking about this. Oh, they are, of course. Yes, this is Learning the Art of Electronics. Um, the other book is just called The Art of Electronics. This introduction to circuit design is unusual in several respects. First, it offers not just explanations, but a full lab course. Each of the 25 daily sessions begins with a discussion of a particular sort of circuit, followed by the chance to try it out and see how it actually behaves. Accordingly, students understand the circuit's operation in a way that is deeper and much more satisfying than the manipulation of formulas. Second, it describes circuits that more traditional engineering introductions would postpone. Thus, on the third day, we build a radio receiver. On the fifth day, we build an operational amplifier from an array of transistors. The digital half of the course centers on applying microcontrollers, but gives exposure to Verilog, a powerful hardware description language. Third, it proceeds at a rapid pace, but requires no prior knowledge of electronics. Students gain intuitive understanding through immersion in good circuit design. Each session is divided into several parts, including notes, labs, and uh, labs. Many also have worked examples and supplementary notes. An appendix introducing Verilog, uh, further appendices giving background facts on oscilloscopes, uh, Zilinx, transmission lines, pinouts, programs, etc., plus advice on parts and equipment. Now I'm just going to make a note here about, so this is, uh, let's just say, learning uh, the art of electronics and I want to make an I just want to look up uh, Zill inks what on earth is that I'm not sure I think I've heard it before and it looks a lot like Linux doesn't it but I don't think it is Okay, uh, there's very little math. This focuses on intuition and practical skills. And then a final chapter showcasing some projects built by students taking the course over the years. Uh, Thomas C. Hayes reached electronics via a circuitous route that started in law school and eventually found him teaching laboratory electronics at Harvard, which he has done for 35 years. He has also taught electronics for the Harvard Summer School, the Harvard Extension School, and for 17 years in Boston University's Department of Physics. He shares authorship of one patent uh, for a device that logs exposure to therapeutic bright light. He and his colleagues are trying to launch this device with a startup company named Good Lux Technologies. Tom designed circuits as the need for them arises in the electronics course. One such design is a versatile display, serial interface and programmer for use with the microcomputer that students build in the course. Paul Horowitz is a research professor of physics and of electrical engineering at Harvard University, where in 1974, he originated the laboratory of electronics course from which emerged the art of electronics. There you go. This is a hands-on lab course published by Cambridge University Press. Let's see if I can keep you all in the in the scene. Gee whiz. Alright, so as we said, this was published in 2016 and this is the seventh printing with corrections in 2020. For Debbie, Tessa, Turner and Jamie 
and in memory of my beloved friend, Jonathan. All right, here we are, the table of contents. Oh, dear me. Look at this. It's a monster. It's a monster. Gee, it's going to take us a while to read through all of that. Wow. And the index starts on page 1,128. Wow. Oh, just give me a second. I'm going to have a break. I'll be back. I'm back. You know, I was thinking uh, that before we take on this table of contents, <clears throat> that we might just uh, might just have a read of the preface uh, and then come back to the contents. It's going to take a long time to read through these. They did say there's 25, 25 projects. <sighs> wow. All right. Oh, gee, this is a real monster of a preface. All right, well, it's four pages and then a legal notice. So I suppose we might as well read it. <clears throat> a book and a course. This is a book for the impatient. It's for a person who's eager to get at the fun and fascination of putting electronics to work. The course squeezes what we facetiously call all of electronics into about 25 days of class. Of course, it's nowhere near all, but we hope it is enough to get an eager person launched and able to design circuits that do their tasks well. Our little claims, <coughs> sorry, our title claims that this volume, which obviously is a book, is also a course. It is that because it embodies a class that Paul Horowitz and I taught together at Harvard for more than 25 years. It embodies that course with great specificity, specificity <laughs> provided, providing what are intended as day-at-a-time doses. <sighs> a day-at-a-time. Notes, lab, problems, supplements. Each day's dose includes not only the usual contents of a book on electronics, notes describing and explaining new circuits, but also a lab exercise, a chance to try out the day's new notions by building circuits that apply these ideas. We think that building the circuits will let you understand them in a way that reading about them cannot. In addition, Nearly every day includes a worked example, and many days include what we call supplementary notes. These, for example, <coughs> early notes on how to read resistors and capacitors, are not for every reader. Some people don't need the note because they already understand the topic. Others will skip the note because they don't want to invest the time on a first pass through the book. That's fine. That's just what we mean by supplementary. It's something like a supplementary vitamin that may be useful, but that you can quite safely live without. What's new? If any reader is acquainted with the student manual published in 1989 to accompany the second edition of The Art of Electronics, it may be worth noting principal difference between this book and that one. First, this book means to be self-sufficient, whereas the earlier book was meant to be read alongside the larger work. Second, the most important changes in content are these. Analog. We devote a day primarily to the intriguing and difficult topic of parasitic oscillations and their cures. We give a day to building a PID circuit, stabilizing a feedback loop that controls a motor's position. We apply signals that form three functions of error signal, the difference between target voltage and output voltage, proportional, integrated, derivative functions of that difference. Proportional, integral, and derivative. And then we've got digital. Uh, applications of programming logical devices, PLDs or PALs, uh, 
uh, program with the high definition hardware description language HDL called Verilog. A shift from the use of microprocessor to a microcontroller in the computer section that concludes the course. This microcontroller, unlike a microprocessor, can operate with little or no additional circuitry, so it is well suited to the construction of useful devices rather than computers. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> and then the website. The book's website, learningtheartofelectronics.com, has a lot more things, in particular code in machine readable form. Appendix H, H lists these. And the style of this book. A reader will gather early on that this book, like the student manual, is strikingly informal. Many figures are hand-drawn, notation may vary, explanation, explanations aim to help intuition rather than to offer a mathematical view of circuits. We emphasize design rather than analysis, and we try hard to devise applications for circuits that are fun. We like it when our design makes sounds, on a good day they emit music, <laughs> and we like to see motors spin. Who's likely to enjoy this book and course? You need not resemble the students who take our course at the university, but you may be interested to know who they are, since the course evolved with them in mind. We teach the course in three distinct forms. Most of our students take it during fall and spring daytime classes at the college. There, about half are undergraduates in the sciences and engineering. The other half are graduate students, including a few cross-registered from MIT who need an introduction quicker and admittedly less deep than electronics courses offered down there. We don't get E majors from there. We get people who want a less formal introduction to the subject. In the night version of the course, we get mostly older students, many of whom work with technology and who have become curious about what's in the box that they work with. Most often, the mysterious box is simply a computer and the student is a programmer. Sometimes the box is a lab setup. We get students from medical labs across the river or an industrial control apparatus that the student would like to demystify. In the summer version of the course, about half our students are rising high school seniors and the ablest of these prove a point we've seen repeatedly. To learn circuit design, you don't need to know any substantial amount of physics or sophisticated math. We see this in the college courses too, where some of our outstanding students have been freshmen, though most students are at least two or three years older. And we can't help boasting, as we did in the preface to the 1989 student manual, that once in a great while a professor takes our course, or at least sits in. One of these buttonholed, <coughs> sorry, one of these buttonholed one of us recently in a hallway on a visit to the university where he was to give a talk. Well, Tom, he said, one of your students finally made good. He was modestly referring to the fact that he'd recently won a Nobel, a Nobel Prize. We wish we could claim <laughs> that we helped him get it. We can't, <laughs> but we're happy to have him as an alumnus. And there's a note here. This was Frank Wilczek. I don't know how to pronounce that name. He, he did sit quietly at the back of our class for a while, hoping for some insights into a simulation that he envisioned. If those nights came, they probably didn't come for us. All right. We expect that some of these notes will strike you as elementary, some as excessively dense. <clears throat> Your reaction, naturally, will reflect the uneven experience you have had with the topics we treat. Some of you are sophisticated programmers and will sail through the assembly language programming near the course's end. Others will find it heavy going. That's all right. The course out of which this book grew has a reputation as fun and not difficult in one sense, but difficult in another. The concepts are straightforward, abstractions are few, but we do pass a lot of information to our students in a short time and we do expect them to achieve literacy rather fast. This course is a lot 
like an introductory lang a lin introductory language course and we hope to teach by the method sometimes called immersion. It is the laboratory exercises that do the best teaching. We hope this book will help to make those exercises instructive. I have to add though, in the spirit of modern jurisprudence, are a reminder to read the legal notices appended to this preface. Okay. Are we going to read the legal notices? He did say we should. The Mothership, Horowitz and Hills, The Art of Electronics. Paul Horowitz launched this course 40 odd years ago and he and Winfield Hill wrote the book that, in its various editions, has served as textbook for this course. That book, now in its third edition and which we will refer to as AOE, remains the reference work on which we rely. We no longer require that students buy it as they take our course. It is so rich and dense that it might cause intellectual indigestion in a student just beginning his study of electronics. But we know that some of our students and readers will want to look more deeply into topics treated in this book and to help those <laughs> we provide cross-references to AOE throughout this book. The fortunate student who has access to AOE can get more than this book <coughs> uh, by itself can offer. Analog and digital, a possible split. In our college course, we go through all the book's material in one term of about 13 weeks. In the night course, which meets just once each week, we do the same material in two terms. The first term treats analog, days 1 to 13, and the second treats digital, days 14 to 26. We know that some other universities use the same split, analog versus digital. It is quite possible to do the digital half before the analog. Only on the first day of digital, when we asked that people build a logic gate from a MOSFET switches, would a person without analog training need a little extra guidance. For the most part, the digital half treats its devices as black boxes and one need not crack open and understand. Uh, we do need to be aware of input and output properties, but these do not raise any subtle analog questions. It is always possible to pair the course somewhat if necessary. We don't like to see any of our labs missed, but we know that the summer version of the class, which compresses it all into a bit more than six weeks, makes the 10th lab optional. Day 10 represents a PID motor controller. And the summer course omits the gratifying but not essential project, digital project lab 20L, in which students build a device of their own design. Wow. Who helped especially with this book? Okay, and then they're going to spend a page saying thank you to a whole bunch of people. That's very nice. Let's read this this uh, legal notice. I want to know what they think is so important. Okay, here we go. In this book, we have attempted to teach the techniques of electronic design using circuit examples and data that we believe to be accurate. However, the examples, data, and other information are intended solely as teaching aids and should not be used in any particular application without independent testing and verification by the person making the application. Independent testing and verification are especially important in any application in which incorrect functioning could result in personal injury or damaged property. For these reasons, we make no warranties, express or implied, that the examples, data or other information in this volume are free of error, that they are consistent with industry standards, or that they will meet the requirements for any particular application. The authors and publisher expressly disclaim the implied warranties of merchability and of fitness for any particular purpose, even if the authors have been advised of a particular purpose and even if a particular purpose is indicated in the book. The authors and publisher also disclaim all liability for direct, indirect, incidental, or consequential damages that result from any use of the examples, data, or other information in this book. In addition, we make no representation regarding whether use of the examples, data, or other information in this volume might infringe others' intellectual property rights, including US and foreign patents. It is the reader's sole responsibility to ensure that he or she is not infringing any intellectual property rights, even for use which is considered to be experimental in nature. By using any of the examples, data or other information in this volume, the reader has agreed to assume all liability for any damages arising from or relating to such use, regardless of whether such liability is based on intellectual property or any other 
cause of action, and regardless of whether the damage is a direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, or any other type of damage, the authors and publisher disclaim any such liability. There you go. So they're worried about damage to property and intellectual property. <coughs> Fair enough. What a world we live in. So, let's go through the table of contents. It's only going to take us three hours. Here we go. So, let's learn about the 25 things. Now, they, they do start with analog. So, part one. Uh, um, oh, as the course begins. We'll read that as well, but we'll do it after we've done the contents. So, let's go. Part one. Analog. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, good, good, good. All right. So part one, analog passive devices. And just before we get started, just give me a quick sec. Okay, I'm back. Let's go. Part one, analog passive devices. Uh, this is um, what are we? What are we going to call them? Lessons. Lesson one. Lesson one. DC circuits. Overview. Three laws. First application: voltage divider. Loading and output impedance. Readings in AOE. Lab, DC circuits. Ohm's law, voltage divider. Converting a meter movement into a voltmeter and ammeter. The diode, I versus V for some mystery boxes. Oscilloscope and function generator. Supplementary notes, resistors, voltage and current. Reading resistors, voltage versus current. Worked examples, DC circuits. Design a voltmeter, current meter, resistor power dissipation, working around imperfections of instruments, Thevenin models, looking through a circuit fragment, and R in, R out, effects of loading. Lesson two, RC circuits, capacitors, time domain view of RCs, frequency domain view of RCs, blocking and decoupling. <coughs> A somewhat mathy view of RC filters, readings in AOE, labs, capacitors, time domain view, frequency domain view, supplementary notes, RC circuits, reading capacitors, C notes, trying for an intuitive grip on capacitors behavior, sweeping frequencies, worked examples, RC circuits, RC filters, RC step response. Lesson three. Diode circuits. Overloaded filter, another reason to follow our 10 times loading rule. Uh, scope probe, inductors, LC resonance circuit, diode circuits, the most important diode application, DC from AC, the most important radio, uh, the most important diode application, unregulated power supply, radio, readings in AOE, lab, Diode circuits, LC resonance circuit, half wave rectifier, full wave bridge rectifier, design exercise, AM radio receiver, fun, <laughs> signal diodes, supplementary notes and jargon, diode circuits, a puzzle, why LC's ringing dies away despite Fourier, jargon, passive devices, <clears throat> worked examples, diode circuits, Power supply design. Z in. Okay. I think Z is impedance, isn't it? And in. So the input impedance, I guess. Okay. Uh, I'm not an expert. <laughs> Part two. Analog discrete transistors. Okay. Uh, lesson number four. Transistors one. Overview of days four and five. Preliminary introductory sketch. The simplest view. Forgetting... Beta. Add quantitative detail. Use beta explicitly. A striking different transistor circuit, the switch. Uh, recapitulation. The important transistor circuits at a glance. AOE reading. Lab. Transistors 1. Transistor preliminaries. Look at devices out of circuit. Emitter follower. Current source. Common emitter for air amplifier, transistor switch, a note on power supply noise. Worked examples, transistors one, emitter follower, 
Phase splitter, input and output impedances of a transistor circuit, transistor switch. Transis uh, lesson 5, transistors 2. Some novelty, but the earlier view of transistors still holds. Reviewish, phase splitter. Another view of transistor behavior, Ebers mole. Complication, distortion in a high gain amplifier. Complications, temperature instability. Reconciling the two views. Ebers mole meets IC equals beta times IB. Difference or differential amplifier. Postscript deriving RE. AOE reading. Lab transistors 2. <coughs> Difference or differential amplifier. Supplementary notes and jargon transistors 2. Two surprises perhaps in behavior of dif differential amp. Uh, current mirrors early effect. Transistor summary, important circuits, jargon, bipolar transistors, worked examples, transistors 2, high gain amplifiers, differential amplifier, op amp innards, diff amp with in an IC operational amplifier. Part 3, analog, operational amplifiers and their applications. Lesson number 6, op amps 1. Overview of feedback. Preliminary negative feedback as a general notion. Feedback in electronics. The op amp golden rules. Applications. Two amplifiers. Inverting amplifier. When do the golden rules apply? Strange things can be put into feedback loop. AOE reading. Lab. Op amps one. A few preliminaries. Open loop test circuit, close the loop follower, non-inverting amplifier, inverting amplifier, summing amplifier, design exercise, unity gain phase shifter, push-pull buffer, current to voltage converter, current source, worked examples, op amps 1, basic different amp, difference amp made with op amp, a more exotic difference amp. Problem, odd summing circuit. Lesson number seven, op amps two, departures from ideal. Old, subtler cases for analysis. Op amp departures from ideal. Four more applications. Differentiator, op amps difference amplifier, AC amplifier, an elegant way to minimize effects of op amp DC errors. AOE reading. Labs, op amps 2, integrator, differentiator, slew rate, AC amplifier, microphone amplifier. Supplementary notes, op amp jargon. Worked examples, op amps 2. The problem, op amp multivolt voltmeter. Lesson 8, op amps 3, nice positive feedback. Useful positive feedback. Comparators, RC relaxation oscillator. Sine oscillator, Wien bridge, AOE reading, lab op amps three, two comparators, op amp RC relaxation oscillator, easiest RC oscillator using IC Schmidt trigger, apply the sawtooth PWM motor drive, IC RC relaxation oscillator five five five, five 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 for low frequency modulation FM. Sine wave oscillator, Wien bridge. Uh, worked examples, op amp three. Schmidt trigger design tips. Problem, heater controller. Lesson nine, op amps four. Parasitic oscillations, active filter. Introduction, active filters. Nasty parasitic oscillations, the problem generally. Parasitic oscillations in op amp circuits. Op amp remedies for keeping loops stable. A general criterion for stabi stability. Parasitic oscillation without op amps. Remedies for parasitic oscillation. Recapitulation to keep circuits quiet. AOE reading. <coughs> Labs op amps for CV, uh, VCVS active filter. Discrete transistor follower. Op amp instability. Phase shift can make an op amp oscillate. Op amp with buffer in feedback loop. 
Supplementary notes, op amps for op amp frequency compensation, active filters, how to improve a simple RC filter, noise diagnosing fuzz, annotated LF411 op amp schematic, quantitative effects of feedback, worked examples, op amps for <coughs> what, what all that op amp gain does for us, stability questions. Lesson 10, op amps 5, PID motor control loop. Examples of real problems that call for this remedy. The PID motor control loop. Designing the controller, custom op amp. Proportional only circuit. Predicting how much gain the loop can tolerate. Derivative, D, AOE reading. Lab op amps 5. Introduction, why bother with the PID loop? PID motor control. Add derivative of the error. Add integral, scope images, effective increasing gain in P only loop. Lesson 11, voltage regulators. Evolving a regulated power supply. Easier, three terminal IC regulators. Thermal design, current sources, crowbar, crowbar over voltage protection. A different scheme, switching regulators, AOE readings. Lab, voltage regulators. Linear voltage regulators, a switching voltage regulator. Worked examples, voltage regulators. Choosing a heatsink, applying a current source IC. Lesson 12, MOSFET switches. Why we treat FETs as we do. Power switching, turning something on or off. A power switch application, audio amplifier. Logic gates, analog switches, applications, testing a sample and hold circuit. AOE reading, lab, MOSFET switches, power MOSFET, analog switches, switching audio amplifier, supplementary notes, MOSFET switches, a physical picture, lesson 13, group audio project, overview, a day of group effort, one concern for everyone, stability, sketchy data sheets for LED and photo transistor, lab, group audio project, Typical waveforms, debugging strategies. Part four, digital gates, flip-flops, counters, PLD, memory. Lesson 14, logic gates, analog versus digital, number codes, two's complement, Combina combinational logic, <clears throat> the usual way to do logic, digital logic, programmable arrays, <clears throat> gate types, TTL and CMOS, noise immunity, more on gate types, A AOE reading, lab, logic gates, preliminary, input and output characteristics of in integrated gates, TTL and CMOS, pathologies, applying IC gates to generate particular logic functions, gate innards, looking within the black box of CMOS logic, supplementary notes, digital jargon, worked examples, logic gates, multiplexing, generic, Binary arithmetic. Lesson 15, flip-flops. Implementing a combinational function. Active low, again. Considering gates as do this, do that functions. XOR versus invert slash pass star function. Or as set slash pass star function. Uh, sequential circuits generally and flip-flops. Applications, more debounces, counters, synchronous counters, another flop application, shift register, AOE reading. Uh, lab, flip flops, a primitive flip flop, SR latch, D type, counters, ripple and synchronous, uh, switch bounce and 3D bounces, shift register. Supplementary note, flip flops, programmable logic devices, flip flop tricks. Lesson 16, counters, old topics, circuit dangers and anomalies, designing a larger, more versatile counter, a recapitulation of useful counter functions, lab 16 L's divide by N counter, uh, counting as a digital design strategy, lab counters, a fork in the road, two paths into microcontrollers, counter lab, 16-bit counter, make horrible music, 
counter applications stopwatch worked examples applications of counters modifying count length strange modulus counters using a counter to measure period thus many possible input quantities bullet timer lesson 17 memory buses memory state machine new name for old notion lab memory ram state machines state machine using pal uh, programmed in Verilog supplementary notes digital debugging and address decoding digital debugging tips address decoding worked examples memory a sequential digital lock solutions part 5 digital analog PLL digital project lab lesson 18 analog to digital <coughs> PLL interfacing among logic families digital analog conversion generally digital to analog DAC methods analog to digital conversion sampling artifacts dither phase locked loop AOE reading lab analog digital PLL analog to digital converter phase locked loop frequency multiplier uh, supplementary notes sampling rules sampling artifacts what's in this chapter general notion sampling produces predictable artifacts in the sampled data examples sampling artifacts in time and frequency domains explanation the images intuitively worked examples analog digital ADC level translator lesson 19 digital project lab a digital project part 6 microcontrollers lesson 20 microprocessors 1 microcomputer basics elements of a minimal machine which controller to use some possible justifications for the hard work of the big board path rediscover the micros control signals some specifics of our lab computer big board branch the first day on the scilab branch oh that's not oh yeah no sorry the aoe reading there we go uh lab microprocessors one uh big board dallas microcomputer install the glue pal wire it partially scilabs one startup supplementary notes microprocessors one pal for microcomputers notes on scilabs ide worked examples a garden of bugs lesson 21 microprocessors 2 io first assembly language what is assembly language why bother with it decoding again code to use the io hardware big board branch comparing assembly language with c code key keypad to display subroutines call stretching operations to 16 bits aoe reading lab microprocessors 2 big board io introduction scilabs 2 input byte operations supplementary notes 8051 addressing modes getting familiar with 8051's addressing modes some 8051 addressing modes illustrated lesson 22 micro 3 bit operations bit operations digression on conditional branching <coughs> lab micro 3 bit operations timers <coughs> Big board lab, bit operations, interrupt, Scilabs 3, timers, pulse width modulation, comparator. Worked examples, bit operations, an orgy of error, the problem, lots of poor and one good solutions. Another way to implement this ready key. Lesson 23, micro 4, interrupts, ADC and DAC. Big ideas from last time, interrupts. Interrupt handling in C. Interfacing ADC and DAC to the micro. Some details of the ADC slash DAC labs. Some suggested lab exercise. Playing with ADC and DAC. Lab micro 4. Interrupts ADC and DAC. Uh, ADC to DAC. Scilabs 4. Interrupt DAC and ADC. Supplementary notes micro 4 using the ride assembler compiler and simulator debugging waveform processing 
Lesson 24, Micro 5, Moving Pointers, Serial Buses. Moving Pointers, D pointer can be useful for Scilabs 4102 tables. Uh, N tests in table operations. Some serial buses, readings. Lab Micro 5, Moving Pointers, Serial Buses. Data Table, SPI Bus, Timers. Scilabs 5, Serial Buses. Supplementary Note, Dallas Program Loader. Dallas Downloader, Hardware Required. Procedure to try the loader, two versions. Debugging, Loader 420, in case you can't write to Flash. Debugging, in case of trouble with COM port assignments. Worked example, table copy, four ways. Several ways to copy a table. Lesson 25, Micro 6, Data Tables. Input and output devices for a microcontroller. Task for big board users, standalone micro. Task for Scilab users, off-chip RAM. Lab, Micro 6, standalone microcontroller. Hardware alternatives, two ways to program the flash ROM. Scilab 6, SPI RAM, Appendix Program Listings. Lesson 26, Project Responsibilities, Toys in, uh, no, it's not responsible. Project Possibilities, Toys in the Attic, One More Microcontroller That May Interest You, Projects, An Invitation and a Caution, Some Pretty Projects, Some Other Memorable Projects, Games, Sensors, actuators, gadgets, stepper motor drive, project ideas, two programs that could be useful, LCD, keypad, and many examples are shown in AOE. Now go forth. <laughs> okay, and then we're into the uh, appendices, and there's a lot of them, A through J. So appendix A, a logic compiler or HDL, Verilog. The form of a Verilog file, design file, Schematics can help one to debug. The form of a Verilog file, simulation test bench, self-checking test bench, flip-flops in Verilog, behavioral versus structural design description, easy versus hard, Verilog allows hierarchical designs, a BCD counter, two alternative ways to instantiate a sub-module, state machines, an instance more appropriate to state form, a bus arbiter, uh, Zilinx ISE offers to lead you by the hand. Uh, blocking uh, versus non-blocking assignments. So I think Zilinx, uh, uh, I think they make uh, FPGAs. And uh, anyway, and they've probably got an IDE. We'll, we'll, we'll learn. I, I've put a note here. We'll, we'll check it out. Okay. Oh, there we go. So... Uh, Appendix B, using the uh, Zilinx logic compiler. Uh, Zilinx, Verilog, and Able, an overview. Uh, Appendix C, transmission lines. A topic we have dodged till now. Uh, a new case, transmission line. Reflections. But why do we care about reflections? Transmission line effects for sinusoidal signals. Appendix D, scope advice. What we don't intend to tell you. What we'd like to tell you. <laughs> Appendix E, parts list. Appendix F, the big picture. Appendix G, where do I go to buy electronic goodies? Appendix H, programs available on website. Appendix I, equipment. Users for this list. Oscilloscope, function generator, powered breadboard, meters, VOM and DVM. Power supply, logic probe, Resistor substitution box, PLD slash FPGA programming pod, hand tools, wire, and appendix J, pinouts, analog and digital. Then there's an index beginning on page 1128. So we read the preface earlier. And I, uh, I suppose we might as well read the overview. Why not? Here we go. Country noises. Phone rings. Phone rings in TV drama. Phone rings in house across the road. Furnace. Refrigerator. Lawnmower. Small plane. TWA. J-ROM Paris to Kennedy. Maybe that's from, yeah. 
Oh, it's, a, it's an airplane. Dishwasher. Cricket. Electric clock. Car, truck. Dead leaves across the road. Mosquito. Paper uncrumples in waste basket. Willow. Raccoon. Chest of drawers. Frog. Woodpecker. Rain on roof. Rain on deck. Blue jay. Okay, this is uh, drawing by Saul Steinberg. Copyright Saul Steinberg Foundation. Or originally published in the New Yorker magazine. Reproduced with permission. Okay. Interesting. Overview. As the course begins. <clears throat> the circuits of the first three days in this course are humbler than what you will see later, and the devices you meet here are probably more familiar to you than, say, transistors, operational amplifiers, or microprocessors. Ohm's law will surprise none of you. I equals C to V over T dt probably sounds at least vaguely familiar. But the circuits elements that this section treats... Hang on a sec. Sorry about that. So, uh, but the circuit elements that this section treats, passive devices, appear over and over in later active circuits. So if a student happens to tell us, I'm going to be away on the day you're doing lab two, we tell her she will have to make up the lab somehow. We tell her that the second lab on RC circuits is the most important in the course. If you do not use that lab to cement your understanding of RC circuits, especially filters, then you will be haunted by muddled thinking for at least the remainder of the analog part of the course. Resistors will give you no trouble. Diodes will seem simple enough, at least in the view that we settle for. They are one-way conductors. Capacitors and inductors behave more strangely. We will see very few circuits that use inductors, but a great many that use capacitors. You are likely to need a good deal of practice before you get comfortable with the central facts of capacitors behavior. Easy to state, hard to get an intuitive grip on. They pass AC, block DC, and only rarely cause large phase shifts. We should also restate a word of reassurance. You can manage this course perfectly even if the dash J in the, <coughs> in the expression for the capacitor's impedance is completely unfamiliar to you. If you consult AOE after reading about complex impedances in AOE's spectacularly dense math review in Appendix A, you feel that you must be spectacularly dense. Don't worry. That is the place in the course where the squeamish may begin to wonder if they ought to retreat to some slower paced treatment of the subject. Do not give up at this point. Hang on until you have seen transistors, at least. One of the most striking qualities of this book is its cheerful evasion of complexity whenever a simpler account can carry you to a good design. The treatment of transistors offers a good example, and you ought to stay with the course long enough to see that. The transistor chapter is difficult, but wonderfully simpler than most other treatments of the subject. You will begin designing useful transistor circuits on your first day with the subject. It is also in the first three labs that you will get used to the lab instruments, and especially to the most important of these, the oscilloscope. It is a complex machine, only practice will teach you to use it well. Do not make the common mistake of thinking that the person next to you who is turning knobs so confidently, flipping switches and adjusting trigger level all on the first or second day of the course is smarter than you are. No, that person has done it before. In two weeks, you too will be making the scope do your bidding. Assuming that you don't leave the work to that person next to you who knew it all from the start. The images on the scope screen make silent and invisible events visible, though strangely abstracted as well. These scope traces will become your mental images of what happens in your circuits. The scope will serve as a time microscope that will let you see events <coughs> that last a handful of nanoseconds. <coughs> the length of time it takes light to get from you to the person sitting 
a little way down the lab bench. You may even find yourself reacting emotionally to shapes on the screen, feeling good when you see a smooth, handsome sine wave, disturbed when you see the peaks of the sine clipped or its shape warped, annoyed when fuzz shows <laughs> grows on your waveforms. Anticipating some of these experiences and to get you in the mood to enjoy coming weeks in which small events will paint their self-portraits on your screen, we offer you a view of some scope uh, traces that never quite occurred and that nevertheless seem just about right. Just what a scope would show if it could. This drawing was posted on my door for years and students who happened by would pause, peer, hesitate, evidently working a bit to put a mental frame around these not quite possible pictures. Sometimes a person would ask if these are scope traces. They are not, of course. The leap uh, beyond what a scope can show was the artist's, Saul Steinberg's. Graciously has allowed us to show his drawing here. We hope you enjoy it. Perhaps it will help you to look on your less exotic scope displays with a little bit of respect and wonder with which we have to look on the traces below. So this is just a, a, an artist's uh, rendering of various sounds that you hear in the country. Fascinating. Now what are we going to do about this monster? Are we going to flip through the whole thing? That's going to take a long time. Oh look, there's AOE references all over the place. Wow. Actually, it's it's kind of amazing. When they talk about a course, is it like a full day? I suppose it must be like a full day. Or if it's an evening course. So much to know, isn't there? Oh, look at that. It's a breadboard. It's funny that they did uh, that the hand-drawn diagrams. I think we're going to flip through the whole thing. Why not? How long do you reckon that's going to take? I don't know. Resistors, voltage and current, designing a voltmeter, and a, and, and a current meter. Yeah, right. I don't know if I've got any uh, any uh, analog meters floating around. I used to when I was a kid. I think there might be one on my uh, 200 in one RC circuits. This was the one that they said was absolutely essential. RC, of course, stands for resistor and capacitor. They said that this particular part of the course was just essential. Uh, there we go, looking at the scope. Frequency domain view. Bit of mathematics. Yeah, I should, I should, I should work my way through this. This is pretty in, intense, isn't it? Two unglamorous but important cap applications: blocking and decoupling. Capacitors block DC. Wow. Labs on capacitors. It says here, it's easy to estimate phase shifts if you make a full period equal eight divisions. Bunch of stuff about capacitors. C notes, trying for an intuitive grip on capacitors behavior. All right, C notes, it literally means like metal C. You know, like uh, the um, 
the 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 tune, the note. There you go. Man, this book looks fantastic, doesn't it? Oh, I would love to engage with this. And what I mean is, I'd I'd love to I'd love to uh, to read it closely and uh, and and work my way through the through the things. But wow, there's a lot of work to do in here, <laughs> isn't it? And that, that, those students that can get through the whole thing in 25 lessons, wow, that's amazing. I'm thinking more like 25 years. What do you reckon? So much to know. Diode circuits. There's a full a full wave bridge rectifier. It's called a full wave bridge rectifier. <sighs> Talking about Zener diodes. Radio. Of course, uh, a um, uh, a diode can detect an AM signal because it. Uh, it lops off half, which just leaves the amplitude modulation as the pulse. Talking about signal diodes, diode circuits, power supply. Well, that's for the full wave bridge rectifier. Fascinating. discrete transistors what are we looking at there the first transistor point contact wow 1947 amazing oh look that's a good um, isn't it it's a the base is the uh, is the control signal, and the flow is the pipe. Never seen that before. A transistor is a valve, not a pump. <laughs> yes, transistor is a valve, not a pump. Oh, so much to know. Transistors as a switch, which is, of course, how we build uh, digital electronics. At least that's how we do it these days. Before the transistor was the uh, the vacuum tube. Emitter follower. Phase splitter. Transistor switch. Transistors two. Shall we? Uh, shall we put Eber's mole in the uh, in the homework? Why not? Huh? I'll look up some details on that and uh, and put it in the show notes. Temperature instability. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> An unstable circuit. Look at that. That's hilarious. It's reaching around and uh, <laughs> controlling itself. That's great. Feedback. Ah. The intrinsic emitter resistance. Intrinsic emitter resistance. RE. Resistance of the emitter. Difference or upper or differential amplifier. Put an integrated circuit there. Simplified op amp. There we go.
transistor summary, important circuits. Worked examples, high gain amplifiers, differential amplifier, op amp inheads, analog operational amplifiers and their applications. Talking about feedback. Wow. That's cool. He made some notes on an old newspaper. Wow. Huh. The op amp golden rules. Golden rule number one. The output tries to do whatever is necessary to make the voltage different between the two inputs zero. Golden rule two. The inputs draw no current. There we go. I think uh, Dave Jones from the EEV blog uh, covered those in uh, some of his videos. I remember uh, hearing about those rules uh, from Dave Jones. When do the golden rules apply? Now that we have applied the golden rules a couple of times, we are ready to understand what they some <laughs> that they sometimes do not apply. Try some cases. Do the rules apply at all? The question may seem silly. Figure 6 and 14A is pretty clearly not a golden rule circuit. It's just a high gain amplifier. Either a mistake or an anticipation of the circuit we will meet as a comparator in lab 8L. It uses no feedback. Figure 6 and 14A works. Figure 6 and 14C. Oh, sorry, that was 14B and this is 14C does not. And the reason is it uses the wrong flavor of feedback. Positive. Okay, there's lots to know. Lots to know about amplifiers. Strange, strange things can be put into feedback loop. <clears throat> okay, strange stuff. Op amps can tidy up after strange stuff within the loop. I see. Uh, a few preliminaries. Open loop test circuit, closed loop follower. Non-inverting amplifier, inverting amplifier. Just uh, have a look back here. Construct the inverting amplifier drawn in figure 6L8, which is here. If you are sly, you will notice that you don't need to start fresh. You can use the non-inverting amplifier simply redefining which terminal is input and which is grounded. Note, keep this circuit set up. You will use it again in 6L6 and 6L7. There you go. Hey, current to voltage converter. Current source. Worked examples. It's a current source. Try the op amp current source shown in figure 6L18. What should the current be? Vary the load pot and watch the current using a digital multimeter. This current source should be so good that it's boring. Now substitute a 10K pot for the 1K and use a second meter or a scope to watch the op amps output voltage as you vary the resistance load. In this case, just the 1K variable R. This second meter should reveal to you why the current source fails when it does fail. Note that this current source, although far more precise and stable than our simple transistor current source, has the disadvantage of requiring a floating load neither side connected to ground. In addition, it has significant speed limitations, leading to problems in a situation where either the output current or load impedance varies at microsecond speed. There you go. So much to know. Basic difference amp made with an op amp. A 
difference amp. More exotic different. More exotic difference amp. Odd summing. Op amp departures from ideal. Ah uh, yes, reality. Very complicated. LF411 data sheet boasts of its current noise spec. There you go. These devices are low cost, high speed JFET input operational amplifiers with very low input offset voltage and guaranteed input offset voltage drift. More applications. Op amp difference amplifier. Integrator. Apply the integrator drive motor position sensor. Oh, and they're using it in a disk drive. Uh, yeah. Easy to forget that there's uh, there's uh, motors that are making your uh, computer work. They've got fans and they've got disk drives. Of course, uh, solid state drives are probably the future. <sighs> Op amp jargon. Bias current, frequency compensation, gain bandwidth product, hysteresis, offset current, offset voltage, open loop, rail to rail, saturation, Smith trigger, single supply op amp, slew rate, summing junction, trans resistance amplifier and virtual ground I'll tell you what I'm going to put in here in the homework is uh, his there I'll link you to the to some details about that worked examples op amps to the problem here's a statement of the design task and some questions A worked example millivolt meter. Oh, that's cool. Uh, nice positive feedback, <laughs> useful positive feedback. Isn't that funny? <laughs> RC relaxation oscillator. Sine wave oscillator. I don't know what Wyan Bridge is. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Wien Bridge? Wine Bridge? Wyan Bridge? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know? If you know, let me know. I'd love to know. So, uh, just keeping on. And the paper is thin because the book is big. Uh, two comparators, op amp, RC relaxation. Uh, pulse width modulation for a, a motor. 555, five, five, low frequency modulation. Here's a quick preview of a technique we will use in Analog Project Lab 13L to send audio across the room as flashes of light. The rate at which light em uh, a light emitting diode LED flashes will convey the audio information. A 555 can do the encoding, converting time varying voltages, the music waveform, to variations in frequency. A simple parallel RLC circuit like the one you built in Lab 3L can decode the FM, converting it back to a time varying voltage, the music waveform. So when they talk about the 555, I assume they're talking about the 555 uh, timer integrated circuit. But I don't know why they put the, the, the quote mark in front of the 555. I've never seen that before. Schmidt trigger. Heater controller. You know, one of the problems that you have with HVAC devices is um, 
you can't turn them on and off, on and off, on and off all the time because it wears them out. Um, but a, uh, a thermostat wants to do just that. So you actually have to put in a delay and it has to get quite a bit colder than you want it before it turns itself off and the, and the vice versa. Parasitic oscillations, the problem generally. Op amp remedies for keeping loops stable. Remedies for parasitic oscillation. VCVS. If any topic in electronics deserves the title Art of, taming oscillations may be that topic. With some trepidation, we invite you to make these nasty events occur. We quoted in chapter 9N the standard variation on Murphy's Law that says, Oscillators won't. Amplifier circuits will. Since today's circuits purport to be amplifiers rather than oscillators, probably they will. Discrete transistor follower. Op amp with buffer in feedback loop. Supplementary notes. Frequency compensation. How to improve an RC filter. There's Bessel again. They talked about Bessel in the in the old book teardown that we just did. Why don't we look up Bessel, huh? Bessel. They seem to be involved with uh, frequency modulation. Quantitative effects of feedback. Look at that thing. That's great. It's like an annotated... Wow, that's cool. There's a, a Wilson mirror. I've never seen a Wilson mirror before. Should I put a note in there? Why not, huh? Man, I got to be careful. I, uh, I I can't make too many notes, or um, you'll never get to the end of them. Assumed op amp specs. Worked examples. PID. Ah. The problem is a familiar one. How to keep a feedback loop stable despite lagging phase shifts within the loop. We saw a collection of troublesome circuits in lab 9L. We found that even the lag introduced by a simple low-pass filter could upset a feedback loop. To stabilize such circuits, we learned several techniques. Wow. Oh, there's a little bit of calculus. PID motor control. Two motor pot assemblies, rotary and slider potentiometers. All right. Voltage regulators. Man, they weren't kidding when they said this has got all of electronics. <laughs> Crowbar over voltage protection. Lab voltage regulators. Linear voltage regulators.
worked examples. MOSFET switches. I believe it's MOSFETs that are used in uh, in like CPUs and most of the stuff that you get in uh, integrated circuits. Who knows? I don't know. What about RAM? Use capacitor, I think. DRAM, dynamic RAM. Static RAM uses uh, a bunch of transistors, which is why it's expensive. SRAM, static RAM. Testing a sample and hold circuit. Is that a latch? I don't know. Car MOSFET. Analog switches. Group audio project. One concern for everyone, stability. Logic gates, here we go. We must have just ticked over to digital, did we? We did. Part four, digital gates, flip-flops, counters, PLD, memory. Logic gates. Ah, unsigned and the good old two's complement. The usual way to do digital logic. Gate types, AOE reading, logic gates, applying IC gates to generate particular logic functions. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break. Well, that wasn't such a quick break, but uh, you couldn't tell, could you? <laughs> All right. Supplementary notes, digital jargon, wow. Uh, active high, active low, assert, assertion level symbol, asynchronous, clear, combinational, decoder, demultiplexer, demux, edge triggered, enable, float, flop, hold time, jam clear, jam load, latch, latency, load, multiplexer or mux, one shot, preset, propagation delay, register, reset, ripple counter, sequential, set, setup time, shift register, state, state machine, synchronous, three state, tri state. Is that everything? I think it is. Hang on. 59. 51? Oh, 49.51. Okay. Uh, multiplexing, generic multiplexing. Ah. <laughs> oh, look at that, it's the Ministry of Truth, listening to everyone's... <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> yeah, if you don't laugh, you cry, right? Binary arithmetic. Wow, flip-flops. I think flip-flop is also called an A-stable multivibrator. Is that right? Oh, no, it's a, a bi-stable multivibrator. 
I'm looking for the word multivibrator, but I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's there. I don't know. Ah, look at that. Some, uh, some Verilog. I was doing a course on uh, VHDL, I think it was. Another one of the HDLs, a hardware description language. And the guy who was running the course, he, he wanted to stress that it is not software. It looks like software because it's all in code, but it's not software. It actually gets burned in and it's hardware description. It's hardware description. It's not software. But it looks like software. Synchronous counters. Shift register. AOE reading. Flip flops. Primitive flip flops. The SR latch. There you go. And D type. Practical flip flops. It turns out that the simple latch is very rarely used in circuit design. A more complicated version, the clocked flip-flop, is much easier to work with. The simplest of the clocked flip-flop types, the D, simply saves its output, Q, what it saw at its input D just before the last clocking edge. The particular D flop used below, the 74HC74, corresponds to a rising edge. The D flop is the workhorse of the flop stable. You will use it a hundred times for each time you use the fancier JK, a device you may have read about, but which we are keeping out of the labs because it is almost obsolete. Perhaps you will never use a JK. There you go. Ah, ripple and synchronous counters. Switch bounce and debounces. Shift register. I was talking about uh, debounces with my mate at the pub on the weekend. You can debounce in software too. Um, you just uh, you you just put in a delay between uh, when an event happened and and when you notify the event happened. Uh, so that if the event happens like three times in a, in a small space, you only send one event. <sighs> Flip-flop tricks. Counters. Designing a larger and more versatile counter. Recapitulation of useful counter functions. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> it says, uh, breadboarded micro makes computer transparent. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, I wonder if this is Ben Eater's. I don't think it is actually. But Ben Eater did this similar thing, made a breadboard computer. Pretty awesome. I think the uh, 6502, I think that's the one. Or is it 6505? I'm not sure. I'll make a note. Is it uh, 6502 or... 6505, the old 8 bit uh, micro that uh, all of the cool computers used to be made from back in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. Wow. All necessarily lines connected to a PAL counter. All right. Stopwatch. Oh, there you go. 
applications of counters. You know, I suppose there was a point in time where a stopwatch was high tech. Seems a bit silly these days. You wouldn't even you wouldn't do it with uh, with the hardware. You do it with software on someone's smartphone. Bullet timer. Here's an application of flip-flops and counters, a circuit that will measure muzzle velocity of a bullet. Wow. Memory, buses, and there's addressed lines and data lines. Ah. <sighs> Memory on RAM, a, a, a lab on RAM. I've been thinking of getting some new RAM, some SODIMs for one of my, my, uh, I think SODIM stands for small outline DIM, I think. It's the, it's the, la it's the laptop RAM. Got to buy some for my, uh, Dell Optiplex 740, 7040, which I've recently installed MP Lab X IDE on so that I can play with, uh, some 8-bit AT Tiny 85 microcontrollers, which I actually got on the bench here, I think. I don't know, have I got one of those there? I'm not sure. Maybe I put them all away. This is my little thing. So that, that, that's the AT, uh, that's the AT Tiny 85 that I'm trying to program. And this is my Arduino Uno that I was trying to use as an ICSP programmer. And this is a little board I made that has some status lights on it. It's, uh, it's got three, three pins. This is ground and these are the signals and it's just got some resistors in there. And this is a um, this is the Spark Fun uh, tiny AVR programmer, I think. Tiny programmer, Spark Fun. I'm pretty sure I successfully used this, but I tried to use it yesterday and I was not successful. So I would have played around with that. Anyway, you might see that uh, in an upcoming video or two. Okay, sequential digital lock. I wonder if it means lock like like a, a, a semaphore or a mutex or whatever. Or is it like a key code or something? Yeah, it's a secret code. All right, it's like a, a, yeah, a lock, like a door lock, not a software lock. When you're doing software locks, you you have to be so careful of uh, race conditions. Digital, analog digital, PLL. PLL is a phase locked loop. Has something to do with uh, transmitting uh, signals. I think it's how they synchronize clocks or something. If you want to know, you could buy yourself a copy of this book and it will tell you all about that. They've recapitulated the uh, the contents. Wow. <sighs> I think CMOS is like the state of the art, and it replaced uh, TTL. TTL was transistor to transistor logic, and it was like five volt logic. It's still it's still used. Uh, but I think that the that the CMOS is 3.3 volts and uh, and I don't know better, cheaper, more reliable, something. I'm not real sure. And I think that's it. It's just uh, TTL and CMOS, and that that's everything. I think. Uh, but I don't know for sure. Sampling artifacts, Diva. Here we go. Phase locked loop. A PLL uses feedback to produce a replica 
or a multiple of an input frequency. It is a lot like an op-amp circuit. The difference is that it amplifies not the voltage difference between the inputs, but the frequency or phase difference. Once the frequencies match, as they do when the circuit is locked, the remaining error is only a phase difference. The phase error signal is applied to a VCO. Uh, you met VCO, the voltage controlled oscillator, back in chapter 13L. There you used a 555 as a rough and ready VCO, voltage controlled oscillator. The phase error signal is applied to a VCO in a sense that tends to diminish the phase error, driving it towards zero. Some phase detectors, like the simple XOR described in 18 and 71, cannot take the phase difference to zero. Others, like the edge sensitive detector of 18 and 72, can take the error to zero. There you go. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Like a discussion of an op-amp circuit. The scheme is simple. The only difficulty in making a phase locked loop work lies in designing the loop filter. We'll postpone that issue for a little while. There you go. And there's an op-amp analogy. We got a phase detector, low pass filter, a voltage controlled oscillator and div division by 1k in lab circuit. It's a frequency divider. Wow. Phase detectors. You know, and in an AM circuit, they call the diode the detector. Germanium diode. Analog to digital PLL. Analog to digital converter. Man, this wasn't kidding, was it? They said all of electronics. Phase lock loop frequency multiplier. Supplementary notes. Sampling rules. Sampling artifacts. Worked examples, analog to digital, digital project lab, microcontrollers, some basics, <laughs> look at them getting smaller and smaller, this is the Scilabs 8051, look how small it is. Wow. That's the 8051. Which controller to use? The variety of available microcontrollers is indeed daunting. It might seem that a person would have to put in a month of study before beginning. Usually though, things are not that bad, largely because most people are not so rational, or is it compulsive, <laughs> as to canvas and evaluate all alternative devices. Instead, most of us ask around, taking the advice of those working near us. That makes sense, because it's a big help to be able to ask advice from someone who has used the particular variety that you undertake to use. This sort of con uh, conserv conservatism, even among people who take pride in working close to the cutting edge of new technology, accounts for the remarkable fact that the 8051 design that we adopt in these labs remains the design most widely sourced, that is, offered by the largest number of manufacturers more than 35 years after it introduced by Intel in 1980. In earlier years, 
the primary reason for this conservatism may have been the desire to take advantage of a large volume of legacy code written for the particular processor or controller. This was important when coding was done in assembly language because a change of processor required a code rewrite. It is not nearly so important now that code is coding is done in higher level languages for controllers, most often in C. Apart from some C extension required for each processor, the higher level code can be ported to a new processor without the pain of a full rewrite, but it remains convenient to stick with one controller in successive projects. Small differences among controllers do call for learning details that it is pleasant to learn once, not repeatedly. Hmm. Ah, the big board path. Rediscover the micro's control signals. <sighs> I'm supposed to be making a MIDI um, device with a microcontroller. It's part of just a fun project. Some of the people in the IRC chat room I hang out in are doing but I, uh, I probably need to get a pick kit for from microchip so that I can program my devices that is unless I can get this stuff that I was pointing out earlier to work if I can get that to work then I don't need to buy any hardware we'll see I don't know how much time I've got for it I'll give it a go kind of busy how about you are you busy I'm busy Scilabs 1, Startup. In this lab 3 to 25 L2, we invite you to take the quick path to using a standalone microcontroller as we suggested in the note to describe the two alternative paths. After 25 L2, as we have said before, the two paths converge. And at that point, we hope you will dream up an application of your own for the microcontroller, whichever route you took to reach this junction. We chose an 8051 type controller, first perhaps obviously to make the two branches of this course consistent. One discussion of internal architecture and assembly language covers the 8051 and the Dallas part used in the other branch. A great many 8051 variations are available of course and many would have been satisfactory. Here is a summary of the considerations that led us to the F410. There you go. <sighs> Supplementary notes. <laughs> Once in a while, debugging is easy. Usually it's not. <laughs> They've got an arrow here pointing to the wire. That's the problem. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I had, a, I had a bug like that yesterday. It was the last wire. I had to buzz out the whole thing and it was the last wire that was plugged in in the wrong spot. It was supposed to be in 64 and it was in 54 instead. Decoding. Code to use the I.O. hardware. Comparing assembly language with C code. Call. Big board, I.O. Introduction. Again in this chapter there are two paths to follow, the big board to start and Scilabs in 21L2. Last time you breathed life into the mess of counters and memory that you had wired in lab 16L and 17L by adding a brain, the 8051. This mess became a computer and proved it by running a tiny loop program. 
the changes today will not rise to this Frankensteinian level. Today, your little machine learns to talk through data displays and listen, reading the keypad. And before we do any coding, we'll add a battery backup for your CMOS RAM so that your program will stay in place even when you turn power off. Of course, one program, <coughs> of course, the one program you entered so far was tiny. When your programs get bigger, this saving feature will become more obviously worthwhile. <laughs> so it, I'm kind of intuiting that uh, there's two different manufacturers of chips or something, and one's called Big Board and the other one's called Scilabs. It kind of seems like what's happening there. Otherwise, I don't understand. Yeah. <sighs> so it's all programming code. Okay, so. Yeah, so when they say there's two paths, you, you don't have to take both paths. You can, you can just use the technology that, that you've chosen and follow that path and that they kind of duplicate it up in the book. So this is more on the 8051. Addressing modes. Bit operations. Conditional branching. Jump not zero, am I right? Bit operations and timers. Big board lab. Talking about interrupts. Wow. Huh. Ah, the bit flip timer program. I saw a program the other day that will convert my Arduino Uno into a ISP, which is a, a programmer. I didn't read the code. It was about a thousand lines of, of code. Uh, I intend to have a look at it and try and figure out what it's doing. The word bit banging was used. Interrupts and converters priority among interrupts interrupt handling in C some details of the ADC and DAC ah. Well, this is certainly a comprehensive course on electronics. Wow. Ah. Ride is offered free for designs using code up to 8K. Uh, R-I-D-E, it's the R-I-D-E, it's, it's an IDE, an Integrated Development Environment. It comes in two modules, a framework called RIDE 7, uh, supporting a variety of microcontrollers, and a module for a particular processor. The particular module that we need is called RKit 51 for the 8051. You must register to get access to these two downloads. You will be sent a serial key that allows use of the hobby version of RKit 51. After you install Ride 7 and the component RKit 51, you can use the program for a week without licensing, but you should proceed with the licensing process. Under Help, click License, choose Serial Activation, you'll be able to enter the serial key. 
Click on a get activation key and the second key will be emailed to you. Enter that and licensing is done. Note by the way the path where Ride is installed. You will need to specify this later to tell Ride where to find your register equate files. On our machine, for example, the INC folder in which such equate in which such equates for the S-Labs controller live is here. C colon program files Raisonance Ride Inc. 51 SI Labs. Yeah, well, I'm not going to be doing that, am I? No. Isn't that sad that they're using uh, proprietary software in, in, in a university textbook? Doesn't seem right, does it? Uh, moving pointers, serial buses. D pointer. Serial buses. <sighs> Thunderbolt. A table listing some serial formats. And then the speed in bits per second. RS232, 19.2K at 50 feet. Original spec now up to f perhaps f 100 kilometers. Wow. RS2, uh, sorry, RS422 and RS485. Differential version, 100K at 4,000 4, feet. <clears throat> All right. Uh, USB 1. USB 2, USB 3, USB 3.1, Thunderbolt, Firewire, and Ethernet. 10 meg to 1 gig. Well, we can do better than 1 gig now. I've got 2.5 gig. I think you can get 10 gig. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know when you have to start using fiber optic cables. I know that I can run uh, 2.5 gig on my uh, Cat6 cables. A hobby servo motor. Serial buses. Uh, supplementary note. Dallas program loader. Oh, okay. Dallas downloader. The Dallas 89C420-30-50 can have its onboard ROM loaded from a computer, let's call it a PC, through its serial port. The loader program decide, described in this note runs only under Windows. Dallas slash Maxim provides no Macintosh or Linux version to our knowledge. <laughs> the on-chip ROM includes a monitor program that normally is hidden by asserting strange pin levels. Uh, one can wake up this monitor program. Your glue step pal does all of that when you assert its pin named loader. Okay. So this is a, a burner programmer, I guess you call them. Yeah, there you go. That's all very specific to some very specific software, isn't it? Uh, table copy four ways. Wow. A little bit of assembly in there. Data tables. <sighs> SPI RAM. I'm going to have a closer look at that. What's it talking about here? It says, figure 25L13. SPI is just barely intelligible.
Yeah, okay. I don't understand SPI yet. I know Mosey is master out, slave in, and MISO is master in, slave out, and they've got SCK, which is the clock. Anyway, more for me to learn. Ah, Toys in the Attic. One more microcontroller that may interest you. We'll not have time to try these PSOC devices, but you may at some later time want to. These integrate a microcontroller with analog parts that can be configured by downloaded code. Alright. So SOC for system on a chip. I don't know what P stands for. Does it say? Not jumping out at me. <sighs> Shall I make a note? Why not, huh? PSOC. <sighs> so these are all little recommendations for... Uh, other projects that you might like to take on for uh, for fun. Ah. So, what do you reckon? Are we going to do all of the projects in this book together? Maybe we do. If we do one a month, if we do one a month. Then we'll be done in a bit, a bit over two years. Wow. Maybe we could do one a month. Here we go, some notes on Verilog. A model of enthusiasm for electronics, though maybe not for its utility. So true. It's the little comic here, it says, uh, Sir, this electronic gizmo serves no purpose at all. <laughs> and the customer's there saying, I'll take it. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> you get into electronics and, and you just make LEDs flash, don't you? You, 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 you write a program in Verilog and it just flashes an LED. If you're lucky, that LED has modulated some music across the room, but you're still just flashing LEDs. <laughs> Talking about the value of a schematic for uh, use when you're debugging your Verilog. Verily, verily. There we go. So there's a little bit of information about how to how to code and test your Verilog. I actually have a Udemy course, or maybe a couple of them, on that topic, and I've I've learnt a little bit about them. It's uh, there's a lot to know. Let's just put it that way. Huh? State machines. Bus Arbiter. That's fun. Zilinx ISE offers to lead you by the hand. It says here, uh, when you aren't in the mood to think, you can call up ISE's substantial library of ready-made designs. All right. There you go. Okay, and this tells you how to how to use the Zilinx um, tool chain, I guess you'd call it. I haven't used an FPGA yet. I actually think this this is a is some sort of PLA. It's an Xbox mod chip. I gotta learn more about them. I don't even know how they work.
I have seen it and I did understand it, but I forget like so many things. Transmission lines, Appendix C. Yeah. Transmission lines. You know, whether it's a transmission line or not depends on the frequency. Because at really high frequencies, it's a transmission line if it's like a couple of centimeters. Whereas at low frequency, it's not a transmission line unless it's long enough. Why do we care about reflections? One can make a plausible argument that these reflections may be harmless. Send a pulse down a long coaxial cable from a logic gate, a low, in, a low output impedance, to another logic gate, a high input impedance. What happens? This case, with logic gate rather than function generator driving the cable, differs from the end open case of C32 in that the signal source is not matched to the cable as the function generator was. 50 ohm input impedance is built into the generator as in your lab instruments. That 50 ohm source impedance swallowed the reflected waveform, so only one reflection occurred. The low output impedance of the logic gate should instead produce a new reflection, an inversion, which travels anew and will get reflected. In short, it looks as if things will get complicated and messy. Indeed they do. There you go. Complicated and messy. Transmission lines. You know, I had some really good books on transmission lines, but I lost them. I picked them out at a garbage sale, like a garage sale, about uh, garbage sale. I suppose that's kind of synonymous. Yeah, about 25 years ago when I was in high school. Anyway, lost them. Scope advice. What we don't intend to tell you. We don't believe we can tell you how to use a scope by writing lots of words. You'll learn by trying it, and if you're lucky, by having someone with experience look over your shoulder as you try. But there are a few points that may be worth writing down and trying to illustrate. What we'd like to tell you. Triggering. Triggering is the hard element in scope use. Triggering is jargon for the scope's mechanism for synchronizing its successive sweeps from left to right across the screen. This synchronization is necessary in order to make the image coherent rather than a muddled overlay of traces. On successive sweeps, the trace had better redraw the waveform in the same left to right position as the previous sweep. If it doesn't, the traces may seem to wander horizontally as in figure D1. The visual effect is thoroughly annoying. Choose the appropriate signal to trigger on. Reject all the duds. Start with the most general issues. Don't start by adjusting the level. Novices often start by twiddling the trigger level knob, hoping uh, to set the waveform to see the waveform stabilize. This is the wrong way to begin. Figures. D2 and D3 illustrate this for analog and digital scopes, respectively. <sighs> Instead, start with the most general issue, in line X. I am going to read this closely, but I'm not going to read it closely with you right now. We'll just keep on going. So they've got some sections on uh, tips for using oscilloscopes. I am definitely going to read that closely. Uh, very soon. Ah, and we've got a, a bunch of um, we've got a parts list. Wow, cool. The parts used in the labs that this book describes are listed below. It's a chore to order them all, so we intend to have someone kit the parts for us in separate analog and digital collections. To find such kits, please visit our website. If you're unable to locate some part, and some on this list are bound to become hard to find, try the excellent part search tool at Octopart. Alright, I'm going to make those two notes. So we've got uh, octopart.com, Octopart, and we've got learningtheartofelectronics.com. Learn the art of electron 
x.com. I'll link to those in the show notes as well. So the part list goes on. Wow. Should I check? I might as well just check, hey? Well, let's have a look at the parts. I've probably got a few of them already anyway. Lamp, inductors, transformer, heat sink, switches, push buttons, dip switches, uh, potentiometers, microphone, diodes, silicon, Zener, Schottky, LEDs, transistors, bipolar, uh, array, optical, MOSFET, array, JFET, uh, SCR, op amp, comparators, voltage regulators, oscillators, crystal oscillators, crystals, filters, audio amps, uh, uh, digital TTL, digital CMOS, CMOS counters, uh, phase lock loop, okay, CMOS 74HCT. Just uh, basically logic, logic chips. Uh, oh, okay, there you go. PAL, the XC9572XL, the Xilinx. So that that's a programmable array, isn't it? So it's like an FPGA. Uh, processor and controller, RAM, converters, DAC and ADC, hexadecimal display, miscellaneous peripherals. PAL, that's in there again. It's the same one. Yeah, okay, that's just the. Uh, oh no. I don't know why they've got that in there too. I don't understand. Custom parts, LCD, SAR, capacitors, resistors. There you go. The big picture. Okay, I'm not sure what that is. Where do I go to buy electronics goodies? Digikey, Mousa, Newark Electronics, Stocking Distributors, Manufacturers Direct, Alibaba, Small Pacific Rim Companies. Uh, huh. Radio Shack, Electronics Flea Markets, surplus stores your best place to start for obsolete ICs is Rochester Electronics a wonderful place that apparently buys up inventories of ICs being discontinued oh, that's a cool idea PC board manufacturer programs available on the website oh, there you go so they've got uh, some assembly language programs by the looks. Some C programs. There you go. Equipment. Oscilloscope. Ah, oh, there we go. They, they mentioned the Regal. MyScope is a Regal. MyScope is the Regal MSO5074. function generator. I've got one or two or a couple of those. Some are cheap and some are expensive. Not very expensive. Pinouts. There we go. That's cool. Isn't it? Very cool. And here we are at the index. So we're done. We made it all the way through this monstrous tome full of interesting things to learn. Wow. All right. So that's it. We're done. Uh, that was learning the art of electronics, a hands-on lab course, 25 lessons, 26 chapters. Um, and I've got a whole page full of notes uh, of things that I'll put in there. In the blog post, uh, Zilinx, I'll link you through to their uh, PAL things. Eber's Mole, I'll figure out that is. I'll tell you about hysteresis. I'll find out what the wine bridge is. I don't even know. 
Uh, Bessel is someone who was working on uh, electronics, uh, particularly FM stuff. I think they use Bessel circuits or functions or something. The Wilson mirror, I don't know what that is, but I'll find out. Uh, the 6502 or the 6505, uh, I'm not sure. I might have got my wires crossed there. I'll check. Uh, PSOC, I'm going to figure out what the P stands for. The SOC is System on Chip, I'm pretty sure. But I'll confirm that with you and I'll li list links through to a couple of the websites that were mentioned in the book. So, wow, we get to the end, we're all done. Uh, I'm not sure what's next. I I'm going to be doing more Sensor Robot 20 stuff and I've got a bunch of uh, projects to do, so there'll be something. If you want to see that, don't forget to hit subscribe. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you again soon.